Good morning. Welcome to the discussion today around the implementation of the American Innovation and Manufacturing Act. Uh, we're going to hold for a few uh, for a minute or so uh, to let people join. Great. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today to discuss the implementation of the um, uh, American Innovation and Manufacturing Act of 2020. We're going to talk about how, how not just to survive, but to win uh, as we phase down HFCs, hydrofluorocarbons. Lauren, you can go to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, today we have with us um, Tim Anderson, who is currently the Director of Principal Engineering for Hussman Corporation. He has 15 years of experience designing, developing, and testing refrigerated display cases operating with both synthetic and natural refrigerants. Tim currently is responsible for developing and commercializing new product platform designs and serving as a technical representative to end users of Husman made equipment. He is active within AHRI, ASHRAE, IEC, and UL technical committees and working group. Uh, Tim received a bachelor's degree in physics from Nebraska Wesleyan University as well as a bachelor's and master's degree in mechanical engineer, uh, engineering from Washington University in St. Louis and an MBA from the Jack Welch Management Institute. <clears throat> Along with Tim, we have, we have Rajan Rajendran, who is the Vice President System Innovation Center and Sustainability at Emerson Climate Technologies. He is the director of Emerson's Helix Innovation Center located at the University of Dayton campus. Rajan serves on various committees in HVAC R industry organizations including AHRI, the Air Conditioning, Heating, and Refrigeration St Institute, uh, the Alliance for Responsible Atmospheric Policy, uh, NAFEM, ASHRAE, and others. He's the vice chair of the Systems Steering Committee at AHRI, a, a committee that which is leading uh, the way in a new approach to defining HVACR system performance. He's also the co-chair of the Global Food Cold Chain Council and represents the United States on <clears throat> the, UN, the UN Refrigerant Technical Options Committee for the Montreal Protocol as the chapter lead author for refrigeration and member of the air conditioning chapters. Rajan coordinates the stewardship and regulatory activities as well as the alternate refrigerants work within Emerson and serves as the official spokesman, spokesperson for Emerson on refrigerant related topics. Rajan has a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Madras in India and earned his master's degree and a doctorate in mechanical engineering from Iowa State University. He also has a master's degree in business administration from Wright State University. Stephen Spletcher is also with us today, and he has spent the last 25 years of his career working in HVACR applications uh, for both equipment and refrigerant manufacturers. His responsibilities have included equipment design and testing, technical service and support, industry training and development of education programs, literature and, and mobile applications. Now with Comores, Stephen continues to support our industry through codes and standards activities, where he serves on a number of committees and working groups related to, to um, uh, HVACR systems. So thank you all for joining us today. Uh, thank you to the panelists uh, for, for, uh, for the discussion that we're going to have. Oh, and I'm Helen walter Terranoni. sorry about that. I'm the Vice President of Regulatory Affairs at the Air Conditioning, Heating, Refrigeration Institute, and very happy to welcome you all here today. Lauren, you can go to the next, thanks. Uh, so now we're going to talk about regulations and, uh, and talk about the American Innovation and Manufacturing Act. Lauren, you can go on. Uh, so you all are likely aware of the Montreal Protocol, which um, uh, managed the phase out of ozone depleting substances, ODSs. Uh, so HCFCs, hydrochlorofluorocarbons, uh, chlorofluorocarbons, HCFCs, 
uh, as well as um, you are likely aware of the US EPA and especially what we want to talk about uh, here today is the 2015 and 16 um, significant new alternatives policy program SNAP program uh, rules 20 and 21 uh, which were finalized at that time uh, so uh, that that essentially uh, removed refrigerants uh, from the approved listing uh, and and uh, made them so that they were no longer allowed to be used at that time. There was litigation, uh, so I'm going to very quickly talk about there was litigation at that time, and uh, the courts determined that uh, EPA uh, should could indeed use global warming potential GWP to determine which refrigerants could be allowed for use, but uh, remanded the rule back to EPA for them to contemplate how it should be applied, uh, who should be subject to the rule, uh, and in which situations, uh, especially in situations where um, stakeholders had already moved away from using ozone depleting substances. Uh, then in 2016, uh, the HFC amendment phasing down the use of HFCs, uh, which is known as the Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol, uh, was put into place. Um, and this 2016 global commitment uh, phases down the use of HFCs on a schedule. Which brings us to the AIM Act on the next slide. Thank you, Lauren. Um, so the AIM Act and the Kigali Amendment both phase down the consumption and production of HFCs. Uh, there is a 2011 to 13 baseline, uh, and there is a, a reduction of 10% and so on, 40%, 70% at various time frames uh, throughout the period. Uh, Lauren, if you go to the next slide, we can talk a little bit more about this. But first, the thing I want to tell you about is that consumption probably doesn't mean what you think it means. It actually is defined as the production plus import of HFCs minus the export of HFCs. And that's how that baseline is calculated. So con consumption is supply and not demand. And the AIM Act is, um, is developed uh, to uh, focus on the supply of refrigerants. So it phases down the available supply of refrigerants of HFCs over time. Uh, so for example, next year, uh, we will be at a 10% reduction. And so we'll be at 90% of the baseline in 2011 to 13. So, um, and we'll be talking about that as we go through. So if you're not familiar with this, we're gonna help you to become familiar. On the consumption side of things, there are something that we call sector-based controls. Uh, and the AIM Act does allow for EPA to implement sector-based controls of hydrofluorocarbons. So you could think about like the SNAP rules, the, the Significant New Alternatives Policy Program rules, 20 and 21, uh, which basically uh, removed allowed refrigerants from the, the list. And so they're no longer allowed. Uh, you could, if you're aware of the AHRI petitions that were submitted, um, to US EPA last week or from uh, other uh, organizations, some NGOs and another industry association uh, submitted petitions, uh, basically uh, asking for a global warming potential, a GWP limit. Um, uh, those would be another example of a, of a sector-based control. And these are specific to specific families of products or equipment types, such as remote condensing units or standalone uh, refrigeration units. Um, so they're very specific to that. Lauren, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so under the AIM Act, the EPA is mandated that they must phase down, develop a phase down program and allocate allowances for production and consumption uh, by October of this year. Uh, they uh, they uh, provided us with a notice of proposed rulemaking, uh, sorry, excuse me. They uh, pushed out a NOTA, they asked for data around developing the baseline from 2011 to 13, because the first thing that they need to do is calculate what that baseline is. Um, now they've been working on that for several months. Uh, we anticipate a notice of proposed rulemaking in May of this year that will kind of uh, explain how the program will work from an allocation perspective. Um, and then uh, they will also need to um, long-term, if there were any petitions related to acceleration, uh, if quota were not used, they would need to address them too under the allocation process. Um, so we anticipate that first rulemaking uh, to start uh, with a NOPER in May, uh, and it must be completed by October of this year. 
they also need to address petitions related to sector-based transitions. So we talked about what those are. Those are the consumption side, right? The, sorry, excuse me. Those are the demand side. Um, and so uh, you can see here a list of five petitions that were submitted. Um, and, uh, and so they, uh, they will have to address those as well. And then finally, the EPA also has uh, authority uh, that, that's very clear under the AIM Act to uh, manage refrigerants. So looking at recovery of refrigerants and those requirements, as well as requirements around a reclaim and also leak reduction uh, and collection of refrigerant at the end of life of equipment. There is a stakeholder meeting on April 26 around recovered refrigerant. So that is certainly something we're looking forward to. So this is, that's kind of the to-do list for EPA. The other thing on the EPA's to-do list that's required under the statute is that EPA needs to determine a baseline and mandatory all allocations for exemptions. So there are exemptions uh, for some very specific small um, quantity of HFC using industries, uh, such as meter dosed inhalers for folks with asthma, uh, defense sprays, marine and trailer structural foam, uh, as well as some electronic gases, and mission critical military end uses such as fire suppression. Um, so I would note as well, uh, just out of, in case you're curious, there is a temporary prohibition, five years, uh, uh, restricting states from enforcing rules with, re with respect to these exempted products. Uh, so that is in place as well. Um, so that's kind of the to-do list for the EPA underneath the AIM Act. Uh, if you go to the next one, Lauren, thank you. Um, so let's talk a little bit about some of the other regulations that exist uh, out there today. So you may be aware, I think likely, that California Air Resources Border CARB uh, also has uh, refrigerant uh, regulations or HFC regulations uh, in, the, in a couple of forms. They have refrigerant management regulations, so they have leak limits, they have requirement for the recovery of HFCs at the end of life of equipment, uh, they have reclaim and recycle rules, and they also have sector-based controls. Uh, they adopted both by statute through legislation and also through uh, regulations, SNAP rules 20 and 21, um, and they implemented, uh, they are in the process of implementing a 150 GWP limit in 2022 for refrigeration, for commercial refrigeration equipment. They've also incorporated into this regulation that they're finalizing a, a kind of a global warming potential, a GWP footprint reduction program for retailers with um, a, a large number of stores. So they, they, those, uh, those organizations, those companies are looking at how they're going to reduce their GWP footprint uh, through charge size reduction by retrofitting to lower GWP refrigerants using low GWP refrigerants and new equipment. And those are some of the tools that we're gonna talk about today. Uh, so, uh, so let me circle back and uh, talk about this definition of allocations. So allocations, so uh, as I mentioned earlier, the EPA has been mandated under the AIM Act to phase down the availability of supply of HFCs. These allocations are uh, a way for that phase down to occur. So basically, uh, companies will or organizations will receive um, a, a set quota or allocation. Uh, and over time, the available allocation will be phased down. So if, a, if an allocation is given to a company, they would decide how the allocation is used. So for example, uh, if a refrigerant producer had an allocation or an importer of refrigerant had an allocation, uh, they might have an allocation for uh, 3,922 3, tons of CO2 equivalent. And with that, um, they could import uh, a ton of, uh, they could, from a carbon dioxide perspective, and with that allocation, they could import a ton of 404A. They could alternately, they could import a few tons of uh, 448 or 449, um, or, or they could produce those products. Uh, so, uh, so they'll be guided with a total uh, basket of carbon dioxide weighted um, from the GWP of the individual chemicals, and they'll decide how those are used. Um, so, it, depending on who receives the allocations, 
uh, will determine how uh, they, and then they will determine how things are used. So from a retail and, and original equipment manufacturer and OEM, um, likely uh, in this first rule, I suspect that we'll see much of that allocation go to producers and importers, and they'll decide with whom they're going to uh, create contractual arrangements to, um, uh, to share allocation, to sell allocation to. Uh, or refrigerants, excuse me, with their allocations. Uh, sorry, and thank you, Lauren. So the HFC allocation phase down is designed to create an economic supply imbalance with demand. So uh, if you think about basic economics, uh, that means that there will be a reduced supply, there will be scarcity, and there will be increased prices. And now we're going to talk a little bit about Europe. So in Europe, uh, there was a pretty chaotic tradition, a transition in the early years. Uh, Lauren, you can go to the next slide. So things happened really quickly and retailers were not ready for this. In the, and, I, and maybe OEMs were not ready for this either. Uh, so uh, their phase down, the orange line shows the Montreal Protocol Amendment, the phase down of HFCs. And the blue line shows the phase down in Europe. You see that the blue line happened much, much faster than the Montreal Protocol, and indeed there was a 37.5% uh, drop in available HFCs and refrigerants in 2018. Now, this happened very, very quickly, and people were not ready for it. And what do I mean by that? So in Europe, if you go to the next slide, Lauren, thank you. Um, in Europe, uh, it was well known that there would be fluorinated gas or F gas bans on equipment, on the use of various HFCs and equipment, largely based on GWP. <clears throat> so for example, in 2020, there's a 2,500 GWP limit for stationary refrigeration equipment. And, um, and so people were preparing for a 2020 transition. But what they didn't expect and they didn't know was that in 2018, with this significant drop in available HFC, that they wouldn't have access to the same refrigerants that they had um, prior to that. Uh, so uh, things became very tight. Things became very confusing. There were companies that uh, had partnerships with suppliers that were unable to access refrigerant. Um, uh, they were not, not able to get as much as they wanted. And they, in some cases, had to pivot and perhaps retrofit very quickly. Uh, because all they could get uh, purchase was a lower GWP refrigerant. So, um, so there is, uh, you know, so it was pretty chaotic. People were thinking about 2020, uh, but they needed to be thinking about 2018 when that big drop in available refrigerant came to pass. Um, so people were kind of, uh, kind of moving along, thinking about 2020. Uh, that 37 and a half percent reduction happened in 2018. Refrigerants were unavailable prices increased and we'll show you a slide about that in a minute here and uh, you know manufacturers retailers and other stakeholders who were waiting to, to transition were unprepared uh, because of these later sector based controls um, you can see here uh, and this is a slide from the cooling post that shows a refrigerant demand uh, and prices so uh, we see that the prices uh, increased significantly up to 10 times uh, the cost of a few years earlier at their peak. Uh, so we see the, the increase in 404A of 1,000%. Um, and it was pretty significant. And again, uh, there's just a lack of availability of supply. And also, uh, these prices went up pretty significantly. Uh, and they have not returned to those uh, pre-phase down levels. So uh, how do we do this differently in the US? How do we proceed with an orderly transition? So if there were no regulations at all, HFC demand would continue to grow. Um, so above those uh, early levels. So if you look on the left-hand side, this very small uh, graph, that shows the increase in reported greenhouse gas uh, emissions to EPA from HFCs from 2010 through 20 uh, for a 10 year period there. And you can see uh, that they continue to grow. So although the baseline is in 2011 to 13, and that's what we're gonna be uh, uh, measuring against, um, uh, the, there has been continued growth. And if we saw continued growth, uh, we'd see something like on the, the, the bar chart on the right. The black lines denote the phase down level. So that's where we need to be to comply with the legislation, to comply with the AIM Act. 
We've got to drop our usage of HFCs uh, overall. Um, uh, from many stakeholders in many industries, we've got to work together to drop our usage of HFCs by that amount. So that's pretty significant. Lauren, thank you. So uh, here is just a bar chart denoting what the SNAP rules. The SNAP rules probably drop uh, HFC demand by somewhere to between 15 to 25 percent. Um, that first 10 percent uh, step next year might be okay if people kind of follow the SNAP rules. Um, the, uh, the next step in 2024, that 40 percent drop, I think is going to be a big challenge and that's the reason that we wanted to bring you all together today. And then, of course, as years go by, 2029, 2034, 2036, the next drops, um, those also, uh, you know, those also are going to be a challenge. And that's, that's why we're here to talk about this today. I talked about some petitions that we have filed uh, with EPA. Um, and I just wanted to note uh, that those petitions plus the SNAP rules, uh, they don't cover these steps down either. Uh, you can see where there's a gap. Um, especially in the early years. Um, uh, they just don't balance things out. And I, <clears throat> I apologize, I did not include the SNAP rules in this one. Um, so you can see that the 2024, the SNAP rules, the reductions, uh, they don't balance out to the drop in allocation. So that's the supply side, the demand side also has to come down. So where's this additional 25% going to come from? So this is, this is the really important part of the conversation. So Rajan is gonna pick this up and talk about the tools in the toolbox to help reduce demand to balance supply to comply with the AIM Act. Thank you, Helen. Um, this, this is actually Helen's dog. Uh, there are options, you know, it's not all doom and gloom. Uh, can we balance that seesaw that she showed earlier? especially when we look at the 2024 and beyond picture. And I think the answer is yes. And I'm only gonna talk about commercial refrigeration here. This is not about air conditioning. It's not about heat pumps. Uh, it's not about uh, commercial air conditioning or residential AC. It's all only about commercial rent. So yes, it can be done, but um, it, it, it is not possible to do it with just one tool out of the toolbox. We need to have multiple ways in which we can go at it. Next chart, please. So um, I, I'm gonna stay on this chart for just a few seconds here. Uh, the, the toolbox that, that we see, and this is by no means a comprehensive list, there's probably one or two other things that we have not thought of that you can add here. But um, the first two are, are the ones that um, are probably most applicable for new refrigeration equipment. And the last three are applicable for existing equipment. And I'm gonna talk from the bottom, from the last of the existing equipment and move my way up to the top. And, and the reason is this, um, existing equipment become super, super important for commercial refrigeration as well as air conditioning. Uh, but uh, for commercial rep, um, which is a topic today, it is definitely uh, extremely critical. So um, let's go to the next chart. Um, so we will talk about leaks and the use of uh, recovered refrigerant and reclaimed refrigerant. Next chart, please. This is a little bit of data. I don't want you to focus too much on the um, pie charts. Uh, I, I, let's not go through that. But the box pretty much summarizes what the data in the pie chart says, which is globally, more than half the GWP, new refrigerant GWP that is produced, goes straight into charging leak, leaking equipment. This is for all of them, stationary ref uh, and, and so on and so forth. So the question is, how do we prevent this? Because when, when Helen is talking about uh, controlling or managing the demand side in order to uh, meet the supply side of the equation, uh, we have to look at lots and lots of different things. How do we choose the equipment we, we design? How do we install them? The preventive maintenance that is required. By the way, when I say preventive maintenance, of course, today's webinar is all about refrigerants and the leaking of refrigerants and so on and so forth. But we all know that preventive maintenance also helps with the energy consumption, which is another part of this equation when it comes to global warming because energy is an indirect part. That is a whole nother webinar altogether. 
And of course, uh, if you do preventive maintenance, you should be doing uh, timely leak detection, uh, leak sensing, leak detection, leak mitigation, and taking corrective action. And when I talk about corrective action, that's where this question of using new refrigerant or using recovered and reclaimed refrigerant comes into the picture. Um, so let us just pause here for a second and say, why is it so important for us to focus on using reclaimed or uh, recovered refrigerant? Let us just ask this question. You saw those bar graphs that Helen showed you earlier. What if I assumed that I don't use any new refrigerant at all in my existing equipment? I only use reclaimed or recovered refrigerant. Next chart, please. That is what happens. Look at that. I'm going to let this thing sink in for a little bit. You saw earlier how Helen showed that we would have a challenge meeting some of these uh, caps in 24 and beyond. If we did not use any new refrigerant going forward for service at needs, this is the picture you get. But I know that's an ideal, ideal world. It's not possible to do that, even though we can certainly aim for it. We may not get there. But there are a couple of other things that you can do along the way, in addition to all those leak mitigation and controls and things like those that we talked about a little while ago. Next chart, please. And that is retrofitting existing equipment. If you have a 404A or a 407A piece of equipment, and you have a lot of charge in it, and it has a potential for leaks and potential for losing a lot of refrigerant in it, you should probably seriously look at converting that refrigerant to another A1 refrigerant. There's a whole sequence of refrigerants that are less than 1500 GWP uh, that may very well work. And of course, you're gonna check with your equipment and component manufacturers to do all of that. But it is possible to retrofit existing equipment. And that needs to be become, that needs to become part of your plan for your whole enterprise. Now, again, let me ask you another what if question. If we assumed that we, we can retrofit at least 50% of all the equipment that we have out there, what would it look like? So let's go back to Helen's bar graph one more time and look at that again. See this, again, I'm gonna let you sink a little bit. The data shows that if, if all I did was retrofit, yes, I can have a huge benefit. This is assuming that I only retrofit 50%. The benefit is tremendous. So um, I, I wanna emphasize one more time because I'm gonna start talking about new equipment after this, that in existing equipment, if you have a lot of refrigerant charge and you have a high GWP gas, retrofitting to a lower GWP refrigerant that you can, as soon as possible, maintaining proper equipment to make sure that you do not leak, having leak detection equipment, having leak mitigation procedures in place, and, and, um, and all of those things become extremely important for you going forward. Now, let's talk about new equipment. This is all about existing. So what about new? Next chart. So when we talk about new equipment, it shouldn't come as a surprise that reducing refrigerant charge and using lower GWP refrigerants is on the list here. But what is also important is for you to look at that different architecture for remote equipment. When you start talking about reducing refrigerant charge, especially in commercial refrigeration, and you are someone that is uh, installing only large central systems, you certainly will have to start looking at other architectures because some of those large central systems are going to become a challenge as we'll just see in a minute. Um, and then I have listed the self-contained equipment as a separate item simply because uh, there is, as, as these remote equipment start going smaller in size, I think you're also going to see the self-contained equipment growing more in value for, for a retailer. Next chart, please. A um, couple of things about this chart. Just focus on the left-hand side. I have listed there self-contained remote condensing, remote condensing greater than 50, distributed and central. This is pretty much the list of equipment that we have when, you know, whether it is CARB or whether it is EPA, petitions and things like that, that's how we have listed them. 
if you look at where we are today, that A1 column, and I've only shown you 407A, there's tons of other refrigerants that I could have put on there, but this is just as an example. All of those different architectures are possible. But notice right at the very bottom, the central architecture. Why did I draw attention to that? Because as we start talking about lower GWP refrigerants that are not A1, you start moving into this second category, which is flammable refrigerants, is the, which is basically the third column and the fourth column. Steve and, and uh, Tim are gonna talk more about that. But as you start moving into that area, some of these very large charge limits are no longer possible. So you are going to have to move into distributed architecture, remote condensing units, as well as self-contained going forward. So we'll just review that in just a minute here. Next chart, please. Let's go to the next chart. Okay. Um, I said I would draw attention to the self-contained. There's a reason for that. One of the reasons is self-contained equipment is something that we all know and we are all comfortable with. Um, but it's not always possible for very, very large uh, retailers to install self-contained equipment everywhere. But it is, it is, there are some things that the self-contained equipment um, has done that is, I think, very, very important. And we need to try and adapt that into some of the remote equipment that we have. And one of the most important things is the fact that they have managed to squeeze the most BTUs or cooling possible out of one pound of refrigerant. So in a very, very compact form, you get a lot of BTUs. And the technology and the techniques that they have used to do that are things that we need to migrate into remote equipment. And I'll just stop right there because there's nothing more um, that I can add on that point for now. Let's go to the next chart. Okay, last two charts of mine. This is pretty much the picture of the existing system designs and commercial refrigeration in North America. On the top left, you have package units and integrated cases. Those are what we call self-contained up to this point. And then of course, in the bottom left, you have remote condensing and distributed units. Everybody understands that. Then you have central racks and all the way to the far right, you have indirect systems. And then on the top right, you have CO2 systems where they're transcritical or hybrid. Everybody understands all these things and you've got charge limits and so on. See what happens as we move forward, the next chart. The central system with thousands of pounds of an A1 refrigerant, unless it is CO2, is probably going to become history. And that's why we have that red X over there. However, whether it is self-contained or whether it is distributed systems, you now begin to see a new category of refrigerant that is showing up and that is called A2L. It's a flammable refrigerant, but a lot less flammable than propane. And that is what uh, Stephen and then um, Tim are gonna talk about. So I'm gonna stop right there and hand it over to them. Thank you, Rajan. So we've talked a lot about moving to low GWP refrigerants and A2Ls, but what is an A2L refrigerant? Next slide, Lauren. So the fact is in order to get to low GWP, our industry is gonna have to accept the use of flammable refrigerants in many applications. But the good news is, is that the A2Ls or lower flammability refrigerants can make this an easier transition. And A2Ls help do this in two primary ways. The first is that A12 refrigerants are very similar to the products they're replacing. And this helps an OEM minimize the level of system redesign that's required. And additionally, even though A2Ls are technically flammable, they have favorable flammability characteristics that help minimize the risk associated with flammability. Next chart, please. So how do A2Ls do this? Well, first, when we compare A12 replacements to the incumbent A1 refrigerants, namely HFCs or HCFCs like R404A or R22, we see that these products have very similar characteristics. First, they have very similar pressure temperature profiles like the example I'm showing here on the right. But they also have similar thermodynamic properties like capacity and efficiency and similar material compatibility. They also tend to use the same types of oils, generally POEs or PVEs that have similar oil compatibility, solubility, or miscibility to many HFC refrigerants. 
And all these factors come together to allow system manufacturers to use similar types of system architectures, although in some cases they will certainly be lower in charge sizes. Now, how are A12s different? Well, A1 refrigerants that we all use, like R404A and R134A, these are the least flammable of the refrigerants, and they're classified as exhibiting no flame propagation, meaning you won't get a flame under normal use conditions. But even A1s can combust and burn when exposed to a flame or at elevated temperatures and pressures. Now, A2Ls, on the other hand, do exhibit lower flammability, which means that there is the potential to have flame propagation under normal use conditions. But what those normal use conditions are and how we define lower flammability is really a function of the refrigerant's flammability parameters. And the first of these that I want to talk about are the lower and upper flammability limits, or the LFL and UFL. These are the minimum and maximum concentrations of a flammable refrigerant in air that will sustain a flame propagation. If you're below the LFL, you don't have enough refrigerant or fuel for the fire. If you're above the UFL, you're too rich and you don't have enough air or oxygen to support the flame. Typically, refrigerants with higher flammability limits help reduce risk because you need to leak out more of these products to form a flammable concentration. Then there's minimum ignition energy or MIE, and that's the amount of energy required to ignite a flammable refrigerant concentration. If you're below that energy level, you won't get an ignition. Refrigerants with higher MIEs help reduce risk because there are fewer things out there that can ignite them. You also have burning velocity, basically the speed at which uh, a flame will propagate through a flammable concentration of refrigerant once you have an ignition. If you have lower burning velocities, the flames will travel slower, you'll have less pressure rise, and the flames may have difficulty propagating once the ignition source is removed, particularly at the lower burning velocities. And finally, there's heat of combustion, or HOC, the amount of heat that's given off by the burning of the refrigerant. And refrigerants with lower heats of combustion also can reduce risk by leading to lower severity ignition events. Next slide, please. So to really understand what we mean by lower flammability for A2Ls, let's compare them to A3 refrigerants. In this example I'm showing here, I'm looking at two well-known A2Ls, R32 or R1234YF, compared to R90 or refrigerant-grade propane. And right away, you can see the difference. The LFLs of the A2Ls are roughly eight times higher, which means you need to leak out a lot more refrigerant to form a flammable concentration. Propane, on the other hand, has a very low minimum ignition energy, or MIE, right around a quarter of a millijoule. And it can be ignited by low energy sources, such as static electrical discharge. However, with the A2Ls, the MIEs are orders of magnitude higher. You typically need either an open flame or strong electrical energy source to sustain an ignition. And then the burning velocities and heats of combustion of the A2Ls are much lower than the A3s, and that can help lead to lower severity ignition events. Next slide, please. So to wrap up the overall comparison of A2Ls and A3s, A2Ls are less likely to form flammable concentrations due to their higher flammability limits. And this allows you to build systems with larger charge sizes in larger applications. A2Ls are also harder to ignite by virtue of their minimum ignition energies, making them safe to use of many common electrical components. And A2Ls are less reactive and have lower burning velocity, which can lead to lower severity ignition events. Next slide, please. So there's been a tremendous amount of research done on A2Ls over the last decade in particular. I just want to show a few examples here. AHRI 8017 investigated potential ignition sources for residential applications and found that many ignition sources in the home would not ignite A2Ls. RD 9013 compared uh, the leak and ignition behavior of an A2L versus an A3 and found the same types of behaviors that I've been talking about here, A2Ls being harder to ignite and lower severity ignition events. And most recently, there's the AHRI 8028 study, which compared A1s and A12 refrigerants in firefighting type scenarios and found that the overall behaviors of these products were very similar. 
So with all that said, I'm going to turn this over to Tim so he can talk, start talking about the safety standards. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, in order to use these low GWP A2L and A3 refrigerants in commercial refrigeration equipment, there are some necessary changes that must take place in the safety standards and codes that cover their design and application. Uh, so I'm going to spend a few minutes discussing um, changes that are being made to the North American commercial equipment, um, commercial refrigeration equipment standard, ULCSA, 60335-2-89, often referred to as 2-89 for short. So in these slides, I'll discuss why the flammable refrigerants are necessary in commercial refrigeration, uh, what's allowed in the upcoming version of 2-89, and finally, how to use flammable refrigerants safely. So the, the purpose of this chart is not to go through the details of all these refrigerants. Instead, it's to illustrate the point that with lower GWP comes flammability. On the x-axis, you can see the GWP of the refrigerant. The pink and red squares denote flammable refrigerants. Uh, except for CO2 and one uh, new low-capacity blend called R471A, which isn't shown on the chart, um, all of the refrigerants for commercial refrigeration with a GWP under 150 are either A3s or A2Ls. Consequently, in many different commercial refrigeration applications, it will be necessary to use flammable refrigerants safely. Recently, in the International uh, Product Safety Standard for Commercial Refrigerators, the charge limit for propane, or R290, was raised to 494 grams, or 1.1 pounds. Similarly, the limit for A2L refrigerants was raised to 1.2 kilograms, or 2.6 pounds. As a result of this change at the international level, UL and CSA have been working together for over a year and a half now to evaluate an increase in charge limits for flammable refrigerants in the North American version of the standard. In the UL CSA proposal for the version of 2-89, the charge limit for A3s of 494 grams is the same as the IEC standard when used in an open piece of equipment. When the equipment is closed, for example, having doors or drawers, this charge limit is reduced to 304 grams or 0.67 pounds. For A2Ls, these limits are approximately four kilograms for open and 2.4 kilograms for closed equipment. So very importantly, um, one major difference from the IEC version is that the UL CSA proposal allows A2L refrigerants to be used in field directed or remote systems with charge sizes up to about 78 kilograms. Using larger, larger amounts of A2L refrigerants in a remote system requires additional safety measures, as I will discuss some more. So when using these larger charge sizes, there are some basic construction requirements for the equipment that include uh, protection of the refrigerant tubing, hermetically sealed systems, a prohibition on low temperature solders and joints, a test to check for any excessive vibration in tubing near the compressor, and a new leakage test to look for the, for the potential for a flammable concentration of gas outside the piece of equipment. This new test, known informally as the adjacent appliance test, is described in Annex CC of the proposed standard. When using more than 150 grams of flammable refrigerant in a single system, a manufacturer must conduct this test to show in the event of a serious leak a flammable concentration of refrigerant will not form outside the piece of equipment. The figure on the right shows the points where the concentration of leaked refrigerant is measured during the test. For a test of an internal leak in a closed unit, after the door is opened, a point directly in front of the unit on a side of access like a shopping aisle, the concentration is allowed to exceed 50% of the LFL for up to five minutes. On the diagram, this point is labeled E. All other measurement points cannot exceed 50% of the lower flammability limit. For a test of an external leak, the concentration of refrigerant cannot exceed 50% of the LFL of that refrigerant at any time during the test at any of the points. If a manufacturer uses mitigation measures as a standard feature, such as a fan to disperse any leaked refrigerant, these are allowed to be used during the test. So as perhaps the most difficult test in the 2-89 standard that an equipment manufacturer must pass, what are the factors that go 
into ensuring that a flame bubble concentration does not form after a leak? Well, the first and the most important, uh, go back, Lauren. The first and the most important is airflow. Moving air will always help disperse leak refrigerant rapidly. Second, if the refrigerant leaks from a location higher off the floor, the denser refrigerant will mix with the surrounding air as it falls. As a result, a leak from a top-mounted condensing unit tends to be lower risk than from a bottom-mounted unit near the floor. Third, the amount of refrigerant leaked can be reduced with the use of a refrigerant detection system tied to isolation valves that close off the section of tubing open to the leak. The amount of refrigerant leaked in this scenario is known as the releasable charge. To use A2Ls in a remote system, this type of setup will be required like in a display case or an ice machine where the unit must pass the Yannick CC test, just as it would for a self-contained unit. Okay, next slide. So in addition to the Yannick CC test, there are additional requirements for equipment when using A2L refrigerants in remote systems. As I mentioned in the previous slide, display and storage cases must use a refrigerant detection system and isolation valves to limit the releasable charge, as well as complying with the Annex CC test. Evaporators and walk-in coolers or freezers with a charge up to 52 times the LFL must use air circulation that is either constant or triggered by a refrigerant detection system. For charges between 52 and 260 times LFL on these systems, the walk-in will be required to have a ventilation system triggered by refrigerant detection. For indoor compressor units and condensing units, safety shutoff valves triggered by refrigerant detection are required. Additionally, air circulation may be required for charge sizes up to 52 times LFL, depending on the room size where the equipment is housed. Above that charge size, a ventilation system triggered by refrigerant detection is mandatory. And finally, for outdoor compressor units and condensing units, the requirements are provided by ASHRAE Standard 15. Regardless of all the mitigation measures I just mentioned, best practices must be used at all times when using flammable refrigerants. This means reducing the number of joints wherever possible. It is very important to test the unit for excessive vibration and piping or other refrigerant containing components. Excessive vibration is one of the leading causes of major refrigerant leaks. Additionally, eliminating potential ignition sources like electrical components that can create arcs and sparks uh, is a must. If a potential ignition source cannot be eliminated, located in a place where leaked refrigerant could never go, like inside a sealed space or at a high point far above any refrigerant containing parts. Incorporate mitigation measures to quickly disperse any refrigerant that could leak out. And importantly, minimize the refrigerant charge. Reduce the internal volume of components just as you would with a, a 150 gram system using R290. So you may be asking yourself, why should we use more than 150 grams of a flammable refrigerant at all? Um, first of all, with A2L refrigerants, 150 grams is really too small to be practical in commercial refrigeration equipment. Um, additionally, larger charge sizes reduce the number of condensing units required. Fewer uh, condensing units result in lower costs for the end user and, a simpler, and simpler, more reliable equipment. It also means that larger compressors will be used, tend, which tend to be more efficient. So aside from the equipment requirements we just covered, we also need the application standards to allow for the use of these refrigerants. So next, Stephen's gonna take us through some of the proposed changes to ASHRAE standard 15 that align with what we just saw in the 2-89 standard. Stephen? Thanks, Tim. As Tim mentioned, ASHRAE 15 is the application standard that we will be using for refrigeration systems. And addendum L, which is currently a proposal to update the standard, is currently out for public review. The comment period of this addendum closes on May 9th, so if you're interested in finding out about this document and possibly commenting it, I recommend you go to the ASHRAE website to review the proposed changes. Next slide, please. So, the purpose of Addendum L is to update ASHRAE 15 to allow for the expanded use of flammable refrigerants in refrigeration applications. Now, ASHRAE 15 was previously updated to allow for the expanded use of flammable refrigerants, but that was for air conditioning 
and that was the addenda D and H of the 2016 edition. Now, while those updates were targeting air conditioning, many of the principles used there can be carried over to commercial refrigeration as well. So addendum L isn't starting with a clean slate or a blank page. We're actually building off requirements that already exist in ASHRAE 15. These updates would apply to safety groups A2L, A2, and A3 refrigerants for self-contained equipment, and would also allow for the use of A2Ls only in field erected systems. And all systems covered by addendum L would have to be listed to the UL 60335-2-89 product design standard that Tim just covered. Next slide, please. So there's been a big effort to try and harmonize the requirements in both the product design and application standard. And therefore, we've been working to update both UL 2-89 and ASHRAE 15 addendum L in parallel. And you can see the similarities when you look at the charge sizes that are proposed in Addendum L. 13 times the LFL for self-contained equipment with A2Ls, A2s, or A3s, and up to 260 times the LFL, or roughly 78 kilograms, for A2Ls and field-erected systems. Now, there are some exceptions to these limits where they don't apply, such as in laboratories with over 100 square feet of space per person, or in industrial occupancies machine rooms, or systems installed outdoors. And these exceptions are exceptions that already exist within ASHRAE 15. Now, something new in Addendum L is a prohibition on installing systems with greater, greater than four times the LFL in charge within 20 feet of an open flame. Now, why four times the LFL? Well, today, manufacturers can build systems with up to 150 grams of flammable refrigerants. And that's roughly four times the LFL of an A3 refrigerant like propane or isobutane. So today you can have a commercial refrigerator with 150 grams of an A3 installed in a commercial kitchen next to an, a cooktop with an open flame. But as we're going to larger charge sizes, we're putting this prohibition of 20 feet on the installation distance so that we build in an extra layer of protection by moving the equipment away from open flames that are a competent ignition source for any flammable refrigerant. Next slide, please. And then there's a few other changes I'd like to point out. Uh, first, there is a compliance criteria path in Addendum L for installing doors on open display cases with flammable refrigerants. Now, installing doors on open display cases has become accepted practice in our industry, but that's with non-flammable or A1 refrigerants. When you change the flammable refrigerants, there's a little bit of a concern because by putting doors on an open display case, you could change the safety dynamics. So the compliance uh, criteria in Addendum L would require you to meet the installation requirements for a new installation of closed cases. And finally, there are some A2L specific requirements, uh, particularly around field erected systems. This includes labeling per the product listing, but it also includes refrigerant detectors for systems with a charge size greater than 13 times the LFL, or roughly four kilograms of an A2L. Now the requirements for the refrigerant detection system are similar to what's in ASHRAE 15 for human comfort systems with A2Ls. But there's also a big box store exception where you might have an evaporator unit hanging from the roof of, a, say, a Costco, where even if you leaked out all of the refrigerant charge from that height in a large open space, your chances of forming a flammable concentration are practically zero. And then finally, there's requirements for compressors and pressure vessels located indoors, and these requirements are largely around ventilation. And they're similar to what's in ASHRAE section 15, section 7.64 right now. Now that section was aimed at uh, geothermal systems or water source heat pumps and utility closets. Since we are scaling up the possible charge size of the applications here with refrigeration chillers, or maybe a mini rack in a uh, back room of a, a supermarket, some additional requirements have been put in place to help handle those larger charge sizes. So with that, I think I'm going to turn it back over to you, Helen. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Appreciate that. So now I'm going to talk briefly about the building code. So the adoption of the safety standards in the building code. So 
some tremendous effort has been made to um, update safety standards uh, so that they um, safely allow for the use of uh, larger charge sizes of A2L, lower flammability, and A3, higher flammability refrigerants. Um, the next step, and you can go to the next slide. Thank you, Lauren. Um, the, the next step is for the safety standards to be adopted into uh, state building codes. And that can be done a couple of different ways, and we're going to talk about them in a minute. So states do need to adopt these safety standards to allow for greater use of A2L and A3 options safely. Um, so can we work together to ensure that states allow these alternatives to be safely used sooner than 2024 um, as an option to prepare? Uh, I would note that um, Washington State and Florida currently allow low GWP refrigerants uh, in air conditioning now. Um, in addition, uh, I would note that Washington State legislation that is uh, sitting on the governor's desk waiting for signature uh, would allow for the use of um, uh, for the adoption of uh, ASHRAE uh, 15 updates and also 2-89 updates uh, by 2023 for a transition there. So we are seeing some action in states moving in this direction. And Lauren, let's go to the next slide and, and talk a little bit about this process, which I think is pretty confusing unless you're an expert in this field. So we heard Stephen and Tim talk about the safety standards. So ASHRAE 34 lists refrigerants and they classify them based on, on safety. So like, like Stephen told us uh, early in the, pro, in the discussion, um, ASHRAE 34 looks at toxicity and A or a B toxicity would be the higher toxicity and then classifies as refrigerants based on flammability level. Uh, so that needs to be adopted into uh, state and local building codes. Um, and then the safety standards, so 2-89 tells us all how to build equipment. Um, and so that's the listing standard. And then ASHRAE 15 is the application or the installation standard. Um, uh, so those are the safety standards we've been discussing. Um, they hopefully will be adopted and updated in the model building code. So that would be ICC, International Code Council, and IAPMO, the International Association of Plumbing and Mechanical Officials, as well as the National Fire Protection Association, NFPA. Um, and then they can either be adopted uh, directly, uh, the model codes can be adopted in the state and local codes, or those safety standards can be adopted directly like Washington State is um, geared up to do. Um, so, uh, and we anticipate the timeline of that happening um, from a model code perspective, it's the 2024 model codes that are up next, but they'll actually kind of be done in 2023 uh, and adopted in states after that. Um, once safety standards are completed, they can be adopted directly into state and local codes. And so that's, you know, that's a question that we need to talk about um, whether or not that's something we could work together to get done. There are thousand, more than a thousand jurisdictions in the U.S. and uh, uh, with building codes and certainly uh, a lot of work will be done to get that across the finish line. Lauren, if you could, could go to the next slide. Um, so let's talk about regulations. We've talked about step one for commercial refrigeration for refrigeration equipment. So uh, kind of um, early on the petition that we submitted last week with a number of uh, stakeholders signing on to that. Um, uh, so why would we want a step two? Why would we need any more regulations? <clears throat> so for, for retailers and companies that have a plan to reduce their HFC footprint, it, it seems interesting that we would want to talk about additional regulations, but we do need others to do the same thing. We need others to have a plan for their reduction of their HFC footprint in order to cross the finish line. We were kind of chatting earlier before the, before the webinar started um, about how important it is that everybody work together to uh, have a successful phase down. Um, you can go to the next slide, Lauren. And so that's kind of what this thinking is about. So if we think about the long-term global warming potential for servicing equipment. So, uh, so let's say that I installed a system this year and it has 404A in it. Um, but long term, I'm not able to access 404A. Maybe the only available GWP for me is uh, 660 GWP in 2029. Now my system is only eight years old and I want it to last a lot longer than that. And I'm gonna be very frustrated if I, um, if I uh, can only access a refrigerant 
with a lower GWP than, than what I was hoping for. So it's important for me to kind of think ahead um, as we go, uh, because you know we're going to need to have um, higher GWP refrigerants available for people like me that install the 404A system. Uh, and that will further take refrigerant uh, GWP away from new equipment. Um, the baseline also will tell us to reduce the GWP footprint in uh, new equipment. And you can kind of see how that reduction takes place over time here. The next slide, Lauren, I think it's a, uh, oh yeah, so we're gonna talk more a little, little, bit, little bit more about balancing supply and demand. And we're gonna get into some questions and have a little bit of a discussion around these issues. So again, the goal is that we balance the lack of available supply. So of 2024 in particular, it's a 40% reduction in supply, just like they had in Europe when it was so chaotic. Um, and we've got the SNAP rules that will reduce things by about 15% and then those step one petitions that kind of help things in 2024. But we got to figure out where that additional 25% is coming from. You've heard Rajan talk about the toolkit um, and, uh, and, and we've heard uh, Tim and Steven talk about the safety standards. You've heard me talk a little bit about building codes. Lauren, you can go to the next slide and then we're gonna, um, we're gonna kind of discuss this a little bit. You can go to the next one too. So refrigeration step two. So where do we go from here? Okay, so this is a, it's a complex chart, but we're gonna talk through this and we're gonna um, let Rajan and Tim and Steve, uh, Steven talk a little bit as well. So, I said before we need to work together, right? So we're, we've got this we've got this supply problem for refrigerants in 2024. They're gonna we're only gonna have 60% of the available supply that was available in 2011 to 13, on average. Uh, <clears throat> and so there are things we can do together. So for example, the auto air conditioning refrigerants have transitioned already to a very very low GWP. So that's great because that GWP can be used for new refrigeration equipment. Um, spray foam and other types of foam, the same thing. Um, uh, some of the, uh, in 2025, the air conditioning equipment petition uh, asks that, G, that a GWP limit be set for 750. That can contribute to new refrigeration equipment. Um, if, if, or if companies design, if manufacturers design with smaller charge sizes, that could improve the GWP available for new equipment. If leaks are reduced and if we use reclaimed refrigerant or re, uh, recovered refrigerant and recycle it, then uh, that would also contribute and increase the available GWP. On the negative side of things, the market has grown significantly since 2011 to 13. And so that's gonna take GWP away from new equipment. Uh, in addition to that, um, before 2025, so in 2024, for example, that GWP of AC is still going to be pretty high. In 2036, um, two-thirds of refrigeration will still need a GWP greater than 1400, even if everybody retrofits their refrigeration equipment. Um, we're still going to need access to uh, high GWP for refrigeration equipment, and that will take away from GWP for new equipment. And so this is what I mean when we all need to work together. All the sectors, all the equipment types, but also different um, sectors uh, that are not even AHRI members or um, may think they're not relevant to this discussion. We need everybody to work together and pull together on this. Um, the next slide, I think, Lauren. Um, so it's going to take all the tools in the toolbox uh, and people are going to need to plan ahead. They're going to need to start thinking now about how to do this. That's why we're talking about building codes now. That's why we're talking about, you know, retrofitting as well as, um, you know, is there a way to reduce your footprint in new, uh, new facilities, uh, new equipment, smaller charge size, uh, like Rajan talked about, lower GWP now. Uh, so something for us to kind of start thinking about. With that, Lauren, I think we can go to the next slide and maybe start talking about um, you know, how to win, right? Like, like how do you win uh, in this transition? Um, you know, it's really about starting now and planning ahead, reducing leaks, recycling refrigerant, you know, talk to your refrigerant suppliers for new and for reclaimed refrigerant, um, you know, talk to reclaimers, uh, you know, and, and determine your plan for retrofits and for new low GWP, smaller charge sized equipment. So Lauren, I think we can go to some questions. So I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and um, Rajan, if you don't mind, I'm going to start with you and I'm going to ask you a question about 
Um, there was a question, a comment submitted around ammonia. We didn't really talk mm -hmm. about ammonia because that's not our, at AHRI, that's just not our area of expertise. Right. Um, but ammonia certainly could be part of the solution from a low GWP perspective. Can you talk a little about that? Yes, um, absolutely. Uh, the comment and the question is correct. Um, when we talk about all the tools in the toolbox, certainly ammonia, in, uh, especially in secondary systems, is a very important tool in the toolbox. And, and you're right, we didn't talk about it. We should have, we should have uh, pointed that out alongside of CO2 and propane and all these A2 refrigerants, plus any other A1 refrigerants that may come along. The other thing I would like to also mention, um, I don't know if this came out very clear in what I was saying, is that third bullet about retrofitting existing equipment, Helen, you don't have to do that if you've got a small charge, factory charge, self-contained piece of equipment. You don't do that. You don't retrofit that unless it is leaking horribly. But if you've got a system that has got hundreds of pounds or thousands of pounds, and let's say it's 404A, then you may want to seriously consider some kind of a retrofit uh, program for those kinds of equipment. Back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Rajan. Really appreciate that. Um, we had some other really good questions. Um, uh, so I want to make sure that I bring those up. Um, so uh, Stephen or Tim, or maybe both of you, if you could speak to this one, Will UL and DOE, uh, Department of Energy, um, and the standards be okay with retrofitting the charge of existing machines? So currently the nameplates specify the refrigerant and charge that left the factory. Do we need any special approvals to make those changes? So, so Stephen, I don't know if you want to start, maybe Tim wants to chime in, but I think that that's an important question for us to talk about. Sure. So there are some requirements in ASHRAE 15 regarding refrigerant conversions where basically you would have a few different options that you could follow, such as OEM instructions or approvals from a, I believe a nationally recognized test lab or other techniques to approve the conversion of equipment. Thank you, Tim, is there anything you'd like to add? Yeah, re relative to DOE, um, DOE compliance is really on the manufacturer of the equipment as it leaves uh, the factory. It's, um, there's no requirement for um, an end user uh, relative to changing the, or retrofitting the refrigerant within that piece of equipment for, for DOE compliance. Hmm. Helen, if I might just say something yep. as well, mm -hmm. as Rajan. I think uh, you know, what, what Steven said and what Tim said are both accurate. But we always uh, recommend that uh, before you do a retrofit, not only check with the, with the refrigerant manufacturer, but also check with the equipment and component manufacturers as relevant, because sometimes there may be some special considerations that you have to apply yeah. before you change the refrigerant out. Yeah, absolutely. Great, that's very helpful. So here's one for me, so I'll answer this one. Uh, will the AIM Act, the American Innovation Manufacturing Act, preempt state action? So. So uh, by law, there's no mandate except for those um, except for those specific exempted products that we listed at the beginning of the webinar early in those slides. Um, there's a five year delay in any enforcement around, um, you know, uh, meter dose inhalers or the others on the list. Uh, but there's no mandate of a preemption for state action. However, what we've seen uh, time and again during these refrigerant transitions is once that EPA text takes action, the states stand down. There were lots of HCFC and CFC uh, regulations back in the day. Um, but once the states saw EPA moving forward, they backed away from that. And we've actually had a conversation, several conversations with the Climate Alliance and asked them to move away from uh, working on um, the adoption of SNAP rules. So they're kind of wrapping up what they've done, but now they're pivoting and we asked them to take a look at the building codes. What could they do from a building code perspective um, to, to address that issue? Because that's an important issue with all those jurisdictions out there. So now they're kind of contemplating how can they work on building codes and get that across the finish line to enable these low GWP solutions. Um, Stephen, I've got one for you. Um, uh, so I know that you sit on IEC, the international standards and the US standards. There's a question here about based on low GWP trends to drive, um, you know, climate 
friendly solutions? Do you expect a global US and European harmonization of standards around 2L adoptions? Um, and uh, uh, one of the questions specifically around uh, how large water cooler, water cooled chillers are used for indoor installation. So um, maybe let's first talk about harmonization and then we'll think about this water cooled chiller piece, Stephen. Sure. So um, the first thing to keep in mind, there are uh, A1 low GWP or non-flammable class one low GWP refrigerant options for chillers, such as uh, R1233ZD or R514A. So those products are out there. As far as harmonization, there, there has been a growing effort to try and have harmonization of standards across different countries and regions, but every country has the ability to have deviations in their standard. And we see that, for example, between the IEC and uh, the UL, for example, versions of the 2-89 standard. So yes, there will be some effort to try and harmonize, but you will see differences throughout different countries. Thank you, Stephen. That's, that's very helpful. <clears throat> uh, Rajan, we would be remiss uh, to have this conversation without talking about carbon dioxide. So um, we, uh, you know, we didn't talk much about ammonia because that's really not our area of expertise. Um, and we, we didn't talk a lot about carbon dioxide because, um, you know, there's not safety standards or building codes uh, kind of change discussions that we need to have there. But could you maybe mention, you know, the availability and, um, you know, ability for people to think about CO2 as a potential yeah. solution? Absolutely. In fact, uh, you've got this uh, toolbox uh, slide in front of everybody. And it clearly says use low GWP in new equipment. And that low GWP, when you look at the A1 solutions, Tim mentioned that CO2 is one of the solutions. And um, he mentioned another, another refrigerant that was less than 150 GWP, but low pressure. Um, the, the important thing about uh, the reason why we did not cover CO2 extensively, even though I had it on a couple of my charts, is simply because um, there is a lot of information out there about uh, this particular tool in the toolbox. And uh, yes, it is uh, certainly a very important um, uh, refrigerant and, and a tool for us to use alongside of propane and alongside of these A2O. And so our, our view was to try and present all the different options. Now, as far as CO2 is concerned, uh, your, 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 your comment is right. Um, certainly uh, the acceptance and the growth of CO2 has been very good in the last several years. And as more and more people have become comfortable with um, the high pressures and what they need to do in order to uh, try and um, um, get the efficiency that they're used to getting out of um, HFC-based equipment, um, I think um, it's becoming uh, definitely, it's, its growth in North America is, is, uh, is good. Now, um, like I said, it is, it is one, you know, the way, the way we look at it as far as the HRI is concerned is that it is one more tool in the toolbox for all of our customers, whether they're OEMs or uh, end users like retailers for them to use. Thank you, Rajan, that's very helpful. So there's, there's a couple here, I think for me, um, so I'm gonna go ahead and talk about regulations again. Um, so one question around uh, the transition date. So um, just to let people know that within the AIM Act, there is a requirement that the uh, once the rule is finalized or promulgated, that uh, there be a one-year delay between that date and the effective date. So, for example, if EPA, you know, takes a, a petition like the one submitted by HRI with, along with the other 35 or 40 uh, signatories, um, even though we asked for a January 1st, 2022 transition date, um, from a practical perspective, uh, you know, aligning with the requirements in the, in the legislation, uh, you know, it'll take a few months for them to get a rule uh, completed um, at very best. Uh, and it's likely that the transition date would some be somewhere along the lines of perhaps January 1st, 2023. So we're asking them to move as quickly as, as they can in good faith. Uh, but we do recognize that that is a limitation in what, um, in what they can do. So, um, so I wanted to make sure we responded to that. One of the other questions was, around Canada. And I would mention that uh, we've had lots of discussions with Environment Climate Change Canada 
around uh, moving forward with um, this transition. Uh, you know, at some point they will have to take another step um, and whether they do that solely through the um, <clears throat> solely through the phase down or they uh, put in place sector-based controls, uh, you know, that's certainly something they're thinking about and uh, will continue conversations. They are well aware of the building code issue and that, um, and uh, you know, we're certainly working with them, you know, for air, air conditioning as well as refrigeration projects uh, to try to move that across the finish line. I would note that UL and CSA are, it's a coordinated harmonized standard. Um, Stephen, I don't know if you want to add anything about that or Tim, but uh, you know that there are members across the border that work on these standards together. So, uh, you know, certainly trying to coordinate things with Canada, it always makes for a better outcome when uh, across the border uh, things are aligned. Um, uh, so let me pause there and see if Stephen or Tim want to add anything about that. So, yeah, I would just uh, comment that we do have uh, members of CSA involved in the standards development process, and that's to try and have their input so that the standards address both the needs of the U.S. and Canada, for example, in those standards. Great. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, there's another regulatory question for me, so I'm going to go ahead and address that, and uh, then we'll talk about uh, training, and then we're gonna we're gonna talk about some more qu of your questions here. Um, so there's a comment here, you know, that uh, in Europe uh, that there were some servicing bans on on uh, new refrigerants above a certain GWP, and that that uh, the thought was that that's been very helpful to bring down demand more uh, in line with supply and kind of moderating the sudden increase in refrigerant prices that we talked about earlier. And, you know, and the question is, you know, do we think that this makes sense for the US market to help, you know, rebalance supply and demand and help this to be an orderly and smooth transition? Um, since it kind of gives the choice between using retrofit, retrofitting or using reclaim. I think that's a really interesting question. And I think, you know, um, <clears throat> in step two, we've been thinking about, you know, uh, a lower GWP, uh, you know, refrigerant allowance um, for new equipment. But I think, you know, at some point, either in step two or in a step three, we're going to need to think about, do we want more regulations uh, for, um, you know, how we service equipment? Or is that something that's best left in the hands of the retailers and other uh, end users? You know, what's the best way forward? You know, uh, many of you have said to me that my number one goal is an orderly to transition. I want certainty. I not want to know when I need to do things. I not want to know what I need to do. So I think that that's going to be a discussion we need to have. I know that for retailers, uh, there can be a need for flexibility. They, you know, I've heard people say that they'd like some flexibility around how they're going to do some business planning. You know, maybe I don't want to retrofit everything next year. Maybe I want to do it on a schedule across 10 years. Um, but I think it's a discussion that we're going to need to have. Um, uh, and kind of think through uh, what's the best way forward. Uh, because as I mentioned, I think on one of the earlier slides that, you know, it's not just about what I do, it's also about what everybody else do, do, uh, does, excuse me. Uh, we all need to work together to make this a su successful transition. So it's an interesting question and appreciate that, that one. Um, uh, there was also a question about the, um, about training. Uh, so, uh, you know, so, I will, in SNAP Rule 23, the proposed rule that we hope will be out in the coming weeks, um, uh, they uh, included a question in the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking about whether or not there should be additional training requirements or additional certification requirements for A2L refrigerants, so, um, or A3 refrigerants, um, although that rule is primarily focused on A2Ls. So, so there certainly is a, uh, certainly something EPA is thinking about, and I'm and I'm I know that various states and jurisdictions have their own requirements. I, I looked at New York State where I live, and uh, there are at least four or five different requirements depending on which city or county you live in, what the certification and licensing requirements are for installing systems and working on systems. So it's certainly something that we have been having a conversation about and uh, continue to kind of grapple with. You know, what's the best way forward? Um, so I think more to come there. It'll be interesting to see what SNAP Rule 23 says about that. Uh, and we'll certainly try to make sure that we're communicating as we learn more about the decisions that are made on this very important topic. 
I would maybe mention as well, oh, let me go ahead and give a shout out for this, Lauren. I know we're not on that slide yet, but um, there is a training webinar uh, in two days um, on A2L refrigerants and A3 refrigerants. Um, and, uh, and so anybody that'd like to sign up for that, uh, it's on our, it's part of our, uh, refrigerant transition series. Uh, so, uh, always happy to have more, uh, participants in those webinars. Uh, so let me stop talking about training there and maybe, uh, turn, uh, to another question. Uh, so one of the questions, and I'm not sure who would like to answer this one, but one of the questions that we got by email before the session, the webinar, was what kind of information should we start sharing with distributors and contractors? What kind of things should distributors start thinking about uh, around this transition? You know, if I look at the tools in the toolkit, Rajan, Stephen, Tim, you know, a lot of that is around servicing equipment and, um, you know, and so distributors, you know, they're gonna wanna be thinking about that as well as contractors. Anybody wanna speak further to that comment? Sorry not to assign this specifically to anybody. Uh, Helen, I'll take a crack at it. I mean, I think one of the first things that distributors will need to know are a lot of the dates that you've talked about here and the timing. Uh, when they have that information, they can communicate that to their customers, and that gives incentive for both them and their customers to get trained to understand what the regulations are and how it will affect them. So that's a really good starting point. And after that, it's important for them to know what kind of options are present and that's what we've been talking about here today so getting trained on safe handling of a2ls or a3s is also very important for distributors to come up to speed on thank you stephen um there's another question here around um sorry around uh there's a question around the petitions so um our uh, petitions uh, are allowed to be filed uh, of course, to any agency at any time, but uh, specifically under the AIM Act, uh, stakeholders are, allow are, are allowed to uh, file petitions for a specific sector-based transition. So um, uh, we worked with a number of retailers as well as OEMs and other stakeholders uh, to determine uh, transition date and GWP limits, global warming potential limits for refrigeration equipment, as well as separately for air conditioning in 2025 with a 750 GWP limit. Um, and those two petitions have separately been filed uh, with EPA, along with a couple other um, uh, uh, petitions that have been filed by some uh, environmental NGOs uh, that, uh, that we have certainly been talking with uh, about this for a number of months uh, around how to best proceed with the transition. Again, these sector-based controls are intended to make this transition more orderly uh, so that we don't see these um, uh, these demand and supply imbalance uh, challenges uh, to be so significant. Um, uh, there's also a question around allocations. Um, uh, so, uh, and I think um, around precharged equipment, uh, since the uh, baseline uh, is looking at greenhouse gas uh, import and production from a bulk perspective. Um, so, so we don't know what direction EPA will take around precharged equipment. It's certainly something that we're looking at um, for, uh, from the perspective of, um, you know, from the perspective of, uh, you know, the best way forward. So, um, so more to come on that. Uh, I don't know the answer yet. I'm not sure EPA does. I think in this allocation rule that's slated to come out. Um, sometime probably in May, the, the proposed rulemaking will include some more information there. So I don't, I'm sorry that we don't, just don't have the answer. Um, uh, so um, uh, I will answer the, the, the best question that we always get. These, these, uh, this webinar is being recorded and it will be available along with the slides on our website. Um, uh, uh, there is a question here and um, Stephen, why don't you take this one? Are HFO, HFC blends included in the phase down? Do, do you feel comfortable to talk about that? I can if you don't, but I, I worry that I talk too much on these things, so. So um, blends of HFCs and HFOs that maybe have a, a medium level GWP would certainly be included. But I believe that, uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, Helen, straight HFOs since they're, they don't contain HFCs would not be included in the phase down. 
<clears throat> yep, that, that's, that's correct, Stephen. So the individual components are, of HFCs are kind of um, bundled up and um, they take the amount of, um, EPA will take the amount produced or imported uh, in 2011 to 13 and multiply each of those refrigerants by their GWPs, add them all up together and create a total basket of CO2 equivalent units. Um, and then uh, as refrigerants are, are used, they will come out of that basket. So I hope that helps in the way that we think about that. And so it, blends are included, the HFC component of the blend is included, like Stephen said. Um, uh, so there, uh, there was a question around A1 refrigerants um, uh, and uh, the ability to continue to use them. There certainly will be cases where there are A1 refrigerants and HFCs allowed for use. Uh, however, many, uh, as Tim showed early in his, in his uh, slot, slide, um, he showed a chart that, uh, kind of a graph that showed that many, many of these lower GWP solutions actually are flammable. Uh, and so we will have to be thinking about flammability. So, but that's not to say that all new all low GWP refrigerants are flammable. Certainly carbon dioxide is not flammable and there are some A1 blends um, out there with lower or medium GWP. Um, uh, so there is that. And I know we probably have time for maybe one or two more questions. So I'm sorry for everybody that we didn't get to. Um, uh, so there's one here around a kind of developing countries are now developing a code of good practices uh, to handle flammable refrigerants and several variants coming out. Um, is uh, kind of what's available in the US and is AHRI thinking about kind of providing um, a guide around this of, of good practices? So maybe I'll kind of speak about this and then others can as well. I know that there is a lot of information coming out. We've got a lot of information on our website um, around handling. I would say there's training materials out there. Um, uh, and so uh, I think that that, uh, you know, certainly is available. We, we hadn't really thought about coming up, uh, developing a code of good practices uh, uh, per se, uh, but it's certainly something uh, that we would want to provide information uh, to, to anyone that is. I don't know, Stephen Rajan, if you have thoughts around uh, that sort of an international question. No, it's uh, the only reason why it's international is because uh, a lot of developing countries have taken the lead for their own countries to, to put together something like this in terms of best practices. And um, they, they don't have the kind of infrastructure that we typically have here. And that's the reason why they took the lead. However, uh, there's a lot of good lessons for us uh, because um, whether it is um, A2L or A3 um, or even, um, you know, any high pressure refrigerant uh, like CO2 or B2L like ammonia, um, as all these refrigerants become more commonplace in the future, um, it's, it's, it's a good idea for us to think about whether we can join together with um, IAAR or um, um, or NAFM or ASHRAE and various other groups and come up with something that we can all disseminate through our own independent um, uh, venues. Because not everybody will get all the information from one, one source. Everybody gets it from multiple sources. So I think the more we can coordinate and provide something like that, I think it's towards goodness. Thank you. Great, thank you, Rajan. Um, so uh, we've got an attendee who asked about um, air conditioning. So I'm just gonna mention this. Um, yes, this, this webinar was primarily focused on refrigeration. Um, from an air conditioning perspective, um, again, uh, the proposal to EPA uh, matches California 750 GWP uh, limit with a, with a 2025 transition date. Um, uh, building codes are starting to be um, updated around the country to enable the use of A2Ls for air conditioning, as well as some for commercial refrigeration, as I noted earlier. Um, if you're looking for more information, certainly contact us after the webinar and I can certainly point you hopefully in the right direction, uh, but around the safety standards, et cetera. Um, there is a question around um, the efficient, the energy efficiency of CO2. I don't, I don't know if somebody would like to answer that in the 
30 seconds that we have left. Um, not it, sure yeah, time I, I, no, I was, I was, I, we should defer <laughs> that question to another okay. webinar. So, yeah. so uh, we, we will we will reach out to the person asking that question and try to provide some additional information there uh, because I think we're just out of time. Um, so Lauren, maybe we can, I'm sorry to the people we didn't get to your questions. Lauren, maybe we could uh, go on to the next couple of slides. We just wanna make sure that we're staying in touch on this. Uh, we wanna continue this conversation with you. Uh, Raja, would you please speak for a moment about the e Emerson E360 webinar uh, that right. is really a, a partner webinar to this one? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, so there, there are being, you know, um, there are numerous webinars on all kinds of different refrigerants put together by a lot of different people. And when we were thinking about putting this webinar together, one of the things that we realized was in the United States, we have experience with ammonia, we have experience with CO2, we have experience with propane, we have experience with other A1, um, you know, hydrofluorocarbon refrigerants. But what we do not have experience in the United States is with using A2L refrigerants in, in, in a commercial refrigeration. Again, this is, a, this is a commercial refrigeration webinar, so we'll only talk about that. And uh, that's when we realized that maybe it's not a bad idea for us to get a European retailer to talk about this. And that's what is gonna happen on May 27th. And that's gonna be at 10 o'clock in the morning, Eastern time. And uh, if you wanna register for it, uh, the attendance, of course, is free, and you can feel free to register it on the, I think if you go to the Emerson E360 website, the registration should be available for you there. Thank you. Thank you, Rajan. Um, the other thing we want to mention is that there is a Reclaim Refrigerant um, EPA stakeholder meeting on April 26th at 1 p.m. And then finally, uh, you know, we want to stay in touch. We want to keep talking with you around this step two uh, for refrigeration. So, um, you know, certainly let us know if you're interested in that. And yeah, here's this contact information for Lauren McGowans and myself. Um, uh, and feel free to contact, with, contact us with your HSC questions. Thank you so much for spending your time with us today. Uh, thank you again to Raj and Tim and Steven. Really appreciate it. Uh, Lauren and Lauren, thank you very much for your support as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.